I just wanted to throw this in there because it was just, I don't know if it, it even fits, but I just wanted to share this experience I had. Like this was probably like three or so years ago. There was a solar eclipse that where I live in Southern Idaho, that was like the, the solar eclipse was like right there. So like where I was at, it was like 90 something percent eclipse, yep. right? So I was like, this is a good day to take LSD. Fuck it. So I took some <laughs> LSD. I didn't time it correctly, unfortunately. So the eclipse happened before it really took effect. But anyways, what happened is I was just at home like all day with my cat, just kind of tripping, listening to music. Just, yeah, you know, I had a really beautiful introspective experience, you know. But at that moment, and I just want to talk about like what's kicking around in your head, like the set and setting, like what is going on what it's working with. This is when I kind of realized that it is a tool that is working with ideas that you already have, which is why you, David, could be like, I am already becoming radicalized and politicized in a very particular way. And of course, I'm going to acknowledge all of these things and they're going to be highlighted during the psychedelic experience. But other people who don't have those ideas kicking in their head just don't have that thought ever occur to them. Sure. So I had just done, I think I was just starting to do interviews uh, regularly for the podcast. I interviewed a professor um, named David Skorbina, who I think is a professor of philosophy and he does like philosophy of technology. And he had actually published a book, um, of his correspondence with Ted Kaczynski. Yeah. uh, Who's a Unabomber. Right. So I have been fascinated by the Unabomber, like without endorsing even all of his ideas or, or his, obviously what he did as far as being a, a actual homegrown terrorist, domestic terrorist. Um, but one thing I, I remembered and I had learned before doing that interview with um, David Skrabina was there was a documentary that came about came out about Kaczynski in which he apparently, I think he was going to Stanford as a student. People need to understand that Ted Kaczynski also had like extremely high IQ. He was a mathematician, just, you know, very, very smart in that regard. And he was involved in the early like experiments that I think the CIA was doing with LSD. It was got, Harvard, I believe. Oh, Harvard. And yeah, he had a yeah he had a professor who like put him through some real serious mental like psychological abuse. But sorry, please. Yeah, yeah, no, but involving like yeah, involving LSD. So yep. that seems to be the point in his personal trajectory uh, where he became like anti civilizational, uh, kind of this neo luddite kind of perspective where he's like, I'm just gonna fucking abandon this whole thing and move out into the woods and build a, have a little cabin. And that's, you know, eventually led to him doing what he did. And, and anyway, as I'm tripping on LSD, I'm thinking about all this shit. And in that state, I totally could understand Kaczynski's perspective. Like I've obviously I never went down that path, but like <laughs> sure. my point is, is like, if you're like a 15 year old or, or 21 year old or whatever, and you're like reading some 4chan shit about, you know, race essentialism and uh, white supremacy and all of this stuff. And then you take a psychedelic experience. It, it is not a guarantee that the psychedelic you take is going to challenge those ideas. It right. may just reinforce them. Totally. And if right? you look at the social context and, and who you're around, I mean, if you're on, let's say 4chan, 8chan, whatever, right? And instead of having a bunch of people being like, hey, man, that's kind of weird or fucked up that you're saying that, right? Instead, you get like a bunch of affirmation. Yeah. Um, I mean, and especially like in a, in a world full of, you know, uh, increasingly atomized people prior to the pandemic, never mind in the context of pandemic, Right. Like at the point where people feel cut off, people feel isolated, people are looking for easy explanations and and ways to cast blame. The notion of these sorts of easy answers or if you look at Q, right, the sort of live action role playing where you can now be the protagonist in your own sort of quest you know, yeah. throw in a little acid. Now I'm going to go ahead and throw this out here because I'm assuming by the time that this is live, we'll already have it, but um, have it up. We received a, a heads up from somebody uh, and Brian Pace is currently should be working on a, a short article on it. But the guy who is next to Angeli in the Capitol, like the he's got like this huge beard. Yeah. And there's one where like Angeli is like holding the flag and the guys to the side of him. And um, so that guy was actually out on like, I don't know if it was like hundred thousand dollar bail or something crazy for um, weed, LSD, and maybe some other drug possession and distribution. And if you look, I think he's got a tattoo of uh, Gamma Goblin, um, which is a, a sort of prolific um, underground dark web supplier of uh, LSD, mescaline, psychedelics. 
Um, he's got a tattoo of the Gamma Goblin um, logo on him, right? So here's this, here's another moment where like, oh, it's like, look, two of perhaps the most notable or or like iconographic uh, figures in this riot, you know, are are both, both seem to have some sort of, of psychedelic connection. And in the case of like Kaczynski and looking at, I mean, and, and this comes back to the MK Ultra shit, as you point out, like, looking at the type of the fact that it wasn't just like psychedelics, but psychedelics plus this sort of strain of authoritarian uh, abuse treatment. I mean, we've seen uh, Ewan Cameron up in Canada. Um, there's people in Mexico, there's people throughout the US where you were talking about psychedelics plus torture. And, you know, when you look at what was used, uh, I think it was at Gitmo, um, and other, you know, and U.S. black sites, like the the notion of um, putting people in stress positions, bombarding them with loud music, flashing lights, like these were things that were done in coordination with with psychedelic uh, drug, you know, with, with dosing people. Um, and in some cases, you know, the the CIA internally, they were also just sort of all dosing each other. I mean, it was a pretty Looking, looking at what was going on in the agency around the time of MK Ultra, uh, yeah, and and in the case of Kaczynski, I mean, so <laughs> uh, I'll point out. I think it was the Chicago Times. Um, one of the, I think it was when Apple X or the iPhone X came out. Yeah. They they ran an article that was something like Ted was right. Um, and <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, <laughs> which was wild to see from a mainstream paper. And I think leaving aside the the actions he took and and um the questions around that like the reality is we do have these huge looming questions about industrial civilization that i can tell you from my own experience are uncomfortable to grapple with on psychedelics but beyond that like they're they make people uncomfortable to even raise in public and one of the things that's come up for me in the context of, of trying to talk about psychedelics for ways of reimagining the world we live in is to try to look at some of the really complex uh, interconnections and, and the costs associated with it. Like one of the questions that came to me in the wake of a, a psychedelic experience and then talking with a friend trying to unpack some of the benefits of industrial civilization was if we come to the conclusion that modern medicine is maybe one of the, the best, if not the highest sort of uh, value that industrial civilization could offer. Like what's the body count of a hospital? Like if we actually think about like the hospital that was near me where I was living at the time, it was running off of a coal fired power plant. So it's like all of the coal that they were bringing to North Carolina from West Virginia, right? You had the mountaintop removal, you had the toxification of the, the water supplies around that, you had the, the pollution to people, never mind like people who were watching their land base just get decimated, you had all the deaths of the animals, you then have the transportation from West Virginia to North Carolina. Um, so then you're burning the coal, right? But then your hospital itself, you've got all of the concrete and the carbon that, that goes into that. You've got all of the computer processors and all of the rare earth mining and refining for that, plus your MRI, fMRI, CAT scan, right? That's all being mined and refined in China by people who are never going to get the benefits of that particular hospital, but bear all the ecological and, and labor exploitation costs. You know, and then, and then there I am, right, on Obamacare, able to access like a small portion of what that hospital has to offer if I get sick and potentially still looking at huge medical debts. And then of course you have things like liquid oxygen, all of the plastics, all of the metals, you know, all of the logistics and transportation networks. And it's like, to me, at the end of the day, it seems pretty simple to say, okay, this isn't necessarily about saving lives full stop. This is about saving certain lives in certain places who can afford in the US access to that care. So is this really like, if this is the greatest good sort of who is this the greatest good for? And can we actually like, is this justifiable? Mm -hmm. And I know that makes people really uncomfortable because you start, you know, you can do it for everything, right? You can do it for what's the cost of a server farm. Like, it's great. Like, I'm thrilled to be able to chat with you. Like, I'm, I'm thrilled to be able sure. to like, have conversations with people all around the world and, sure. and like engage in these exchanges of ideas. But if we think about the suffering that that's predicated on, like I would rather, I think, um, I would rather live in a world where like that level of communication wasn't possible because there wasn't all of the sort of horrific 
byproducts or, or atrocities at the core of it. But again, like, like that level of there, there's a lot of discomfort, you know, like, would people even be willing to give up like HVAC, you know, AC heat, sort of like, like, where, right. where do the lines get drawn? And who gets to make those decisions? Yeah. Yeah. And, and Particularly I, in a world with billionaires. Sorry. Sure, for sure. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> well, and I think there's this other part to it where, like, one of the you, you mentioned the Mercer's funding or providing some financial support for maps, which of course is at the forefront of psychedelic research and getting it legalized, at least in the United States. And it seems like, I think in the United Kingdom too, as well, I think they have their, could be wrong, but. Yeah, MAPS is looking to get into Europe. I'm not sure where they stand. Uh, Compass, the psilocybin folks are, they're headquartered in London and are, okay. um, as I understand, they're, they're the people behind some imperial studies and, and looking to get into some other stuff. Yeah, yeah, so with specifically with like maps i feel like them pushing for the legalization of mdma is centered around therapy for people that have ptsd mm -hmm. and like you mentioned with the mercer specifically they're like we want to provide uh therapy adequate therapy which mdma is amazing for like that's true um in in conjunction with you know having a therapist and a person present and, and all that um but this was specifically for the troops, for veterans, for people in the military or have left the military who obviously like serving in the military, even just going through boot camp and all of the things you have to do to become a trained soldier. That itself, in my opinion, is a traumatizing experience. I know sure. people who have served in the military, never fought, never, never engaged in combat. They came out of that fucked up. Like they have serious PTSD just because of the nature of the military and how it's structured. Now, what I see is like, what should happen is you take a, have a psychedelic experience and you realize like, oh, we shouldn't have the military. Like we should live in a world where this isn't like, what the fuck is this? Instead, it's like, let's just treat soldiers so they can continue to operate at the highest level possible. And if that means implementing LSD or MDMA into the equation, then we're, then we're for it. So again, just like you, you know, they don't really want to have this deeper political analysis and an, analyzing like the systemic issues that are producing mental health issues in the first place. I mean, yeah. yeah. And, well, and I just want to say, sorry, one thing, this last thing is like, there was such a potent example of this. And again, the most recent plus three podcast, you were, I don't know if you were saying it or, or who, who you were with on that, talking about like talking about these, again, these people promoting psychedelic therapy and stuff and helping with mental health issues during the pandemic and driving past people who are houseless. I mean, mm. like, Oh, that was Brian Pace. Yeah. That was Brian yep. Pace. Okay. It's like, so you see this or Brian Norman, but yeah, Brian yeah. Norman, yeah. Like this, this huge, like looming, not looming. It's a present crisis and it's only getting worse where people are being evicted. There is mental health issues involved in that going to them and saying, if you just take this compound, we'll be able to address your mental health issues. I'm like, motherfucker, I don't have a house. What right. are you talking about? Yep. You trip on the street. What are you fucking saying? That doesn't make any sense. It's so pathetic and absurd. And that's what they're put. That's what they're selling to us. It seems like, and I, and yeah, I get the mental health issues and how that's a, this is a part of that. And anything that we can do to help people get through that, any tools of, at our disposal, if MDMA or whatever it is, is used in the proper context. Great but let's not get away from the fundamental material conditions that are producing these crises to begin with. It's like slapping people over the fucking head. Like, what are you talking about? Uh, yeah, man. no, that's, and there's so much there. Like, so, so things that come to mind just immediately in response to that are, I think it was mm, four or five years ago, something like that. Hawaii, I think the governor of Hawaii was looking to um, treat, was looking to have homelessness designated as a, um, as a health issue uh, yeah. because it would allow them to free up certain funds that had been earmarked for health spending but that weren't getting spent and they were like look if we can designate homelessness as a health issue we can actually prescribe housing and we can use uh this funding to subsidize housing for homeless folks recognizing that like when you get people into housing um looking at it in that sort of pure, uh, horrible economic sense, like the, the costs associated with, um, you know, not having a permanent residence, 
um, you have all sorts of, the same way looking, look, excuse me, looking at um, preventative treatment versus like ER, right? Like the notion of when you have somebody who's got like a stable residence who can then get the services they need, like if they need mental health care, like you now have a, an address at which like services can be rendered. You have like all of these things that follow from having a stable place to live. And like, sure, you could talk about psychedelic treatments down the line, but when you're dealing with those material realities, there are fundamental things that I think quite clearly should precede uh, psychedelic for, for mental health care. And, and on top of that, you know, and that also leads aside the question of like what um, the degree to which uh, houselessness like creates worse uh, effects, right, from some of these issues, especially when we're talking about things like exposure, especially when we're talking about in the context of pandemic. I mean, there's like such a, a, a likely cascade of effects on the back of that, that you know, starting with securing like food, clothes, shelter seems like a pretty logical place to me. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But with you talking about the um, say MDMA for PTSD in, in troops or what have you, like, and, and you brought up the point about basic training. Like I have a friend who is doing psychedelic therapy, who is a therapist who is doing, I think they were approved for uh, ketamine and cannabis therapy. Mm -hmm. And they were working with, uh, with, populations of, of folks who had been enlisted. And some of those people, when they described their experiences going through basic, when they described the, the cultures of alcoholism and the sort of uh, substance abuse that they were subjected to, the type of hazing, the type of trauma, um, you know, never mind like the early childhood trauma that a number of them seem to have experienced. Like there's there are so many underlying issues there that like, when they were treating them, they were they were unpacking. And again, in some cases, you're talking about people who haven't served, people who, when you look at the suicidality among uh, American service members, you see that that the majority of people who are killing themselves are, are folks who have not seen actual uh, combat, which raises, again, huge questions about what the fuck is going on in basic that's like yeah. contributing yeah. to this. Mm -hmm. um, and then you think about, okay, so you have a, a, a military spend, right? Each Each enlisted person comes with a price tag for the you know the military, so if you're able to spend a, a significantly smaller amount of money on MDMA therapy in order to keep people combat ready or at least not killing themselves, you know there seems to be a purely economic incentive to that. And then looking at the way that some of this stuff gets broken down, I mean, I think it leads to people uh, misemphasizing things. So there was a quote that Rick Dahl when the head of MAPS gave in, in 2006, where he said, I started thinking about how traumatic it would be for, for a police officer to see the mur murdered body of a pregnant woman. Uh, MAPS and this other organization um, developed a memorandum of understanding for a potential study of MDMA-assisted psychotherapy for PTSD in Canadian RCMP officers. And when I read that quote, I was just struck by the fact that like, so you heard about a murdered pregnant woman and immediately you thought about how traumatic it would be for the cop finding her body. Like, like yeah. what about her family? What about like, like that's just such a weird, like it strikes me as such a misplaced um, yeah. engagement. And it seems, you know, I, 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 this is purely speculative, but like this has that sort of support the troops logic, right? That if you can support, you know, back the blue, support the troops, like there's that propaganda inherent to that which I would, I would agree with you. I think that's inherently resistant to the notion of engaging in systemic critique because at the point where you're asking, well, why do we have police or why do we have soldiers or why are we engaged in endless foreign wars? You're already so far off script as far as, you know, what, what we're expected to engage in as far as societal norms that can't really have that.